Thank you, Dave. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare to seek him in his word this morning. Father, we just thank you today for the awesome time of worship. Father, we thank you as our nation celebrates our independence and we celebrate our independence from sin and our dependence on you. And we thank you even today that in this chapter we will see that all that we have in the spiritual realm was built around one simple thing, believing you. That's all we had to do was believe you and you could set us free. And so we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Romans chapter 4, we're going to see that belief is the most important element in determining our eternal destiny. But this understanding of the importance of belief was not unique to Jewish or Christian traditions. In fact, the ancient Egyptians had a similar concept. If you've ever noticed the photos of the mummies, you see how all the pharaohs were buried with, buried with their arms crossed and their toes pointed down. And this is because they believed in the afterlife there will be water slides. <laughs> No, but following up on Pastor Josh's message from last week, the key point in belief that we're going to encounter in Romans chapter 4 is that Abraham was accounted righteous by his faith. That's all. Not his good works. And here's how that is established in the first three verses of Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say? that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So righteousness is not something that any human being gains on their own. We don't have it. In fact, Isaiah 64, 6 says that the best we can do on our best day, trying to be righteous on our own, looks like filthy rags to God. Like, yeah, it's not going to work. But Abraham, the father of our faith, demonstrated how to become righteous through faith. And so I want to look at those first two verses again of chapter 4. This time I want to read them from the Living Bible. It says, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of the Jewish nation. What were his experiences concerning this question of being saved by faith? Was it because of his good deeds that God accepted him? If so, then he would have something to boast about. But from God's point of view, Abraham had no basis at all for pride, and neither do we. And so what Paul is doing, he's taking us back to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, where it says, Then he, meaning Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he, meaning God, credited it to him as righteousness. That's it. That was the simple transaction. You believe, you're righteous. No works. And in verses 4 and 5, Paul points out the difference between something that is earned by working and something that is simply given as a gift. He says, now to the one who works, the wages are not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as, as righteousness. In other words, what Paul's saying here is your paycheck is not a gift. You earned it. You don't have to send a thank you card to your boss every time you get paid. But if you can't possibly earn enough to pay for what you owe, and someone goes ahead and forgives your debt because you believed that they could save you, that's a gift, something you didn't work for. And that's what's emphasized again in verses 6 through 8. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the person to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, 
Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. And those verses that we just read there, verses 7 and 8, are actually just a quote. They're just from Psalm uh, 32, verses 1 and 2. And in this psalm, King David is rejoicing in the blessing of knowing that God simply can forgive a man's sins by covering them over with his grace. Not because we deserve it, not because we earn it. We just sang that in, in reckless love. We don't deserve it, we don't earn it, but he gives it to us. And then in verses 9 through 12, Paul addresses whether this gift of forgiveness through faith can be obtained by Gentiles as well as by Jews. And he uses the example of circumcision. That was God's sign of his covenant with the people of Israel. And Paul points out that the moment that Abraham believed in God and became righteous by faith happened before that covenant was established. So it can't have anything to do with keeping that covenant because this happened first. The covenant with Abraham was simply by faith. And he continues to say in verses 13 and 14 that anyone who is a true follower of Abraham comes to God only by faith and not by working his way into God's favor or trying to keep the law. For the promise, he says in verse 13, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be the heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, then faith is made void and the promise is nullified. What he's saying here is in verse 14 is that if you could, and you can't, but if you could earn your salvation by keeping the law, then why did God promise Abraham that he would become righteous simply by believing if there were two different ways to do it? But they're not. There's one way to do it. In verse 15, he has to address the obvious issue. Okay, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everything you're saying here tells me the law, the law doesn't matter. Why did God give us the law? In verse 15, he tells us, for the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there's also no violation. So think about it this way. Breaking the law brings consequences. If there's no laws, there's no consequences. If there's no consequences, there's no need for forgiveness. So the law had to come so that people would recognize that we needed forgiveness. You give me 10 commandments, I look at them and go, ooh, I break them all the time. I need forgiveness. The law had to come to make us aware of our need for salvation. Now, you could argue that if I perfectly obey the law, there would be no consequences. Mm, yeah, but I already saw this in chapter 3, verse 10. There is no righteous person, not even one. So if you're thinking to yourself, I might be that one who could keep the law perfectly, you're not. You're not. That's not going to work. And then you add in what James 2.10 points out. Because James says this, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all. In other words, there's not just the Ten Commandments. The, the law of Moses had 630 some. And if you, if you kept all of them except one, you're guilty of breaking them all. That's the way it works. Don't try that. Don't try this at home, kids. Try faith. So you're going along and you're trying to keep every single law and you mess up one time and you know, you're guilty of everything and no, no. That's why I'm glad that there was another way to righteousness that he gave to Abraham. I think a lot of people are happy that faith is a better way to righteousness than trying to live a perfect life because everyone who chooses the path of faith instead of the path of works becomes a descendant of Abraham. And that's what verses 16 and 17 say. For this reason, meaning that you can't earn it, for this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, 
so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, that's the Jewish people, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed, that is God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that do not exist. Okay, so what this is saying is you don't have to be Jewish to be a descendant of Abraham. You just have to have faith. Abraham's legacy isn't the law. The law was the legacy of Moses. Abraham's legacy was faith. And if you've ever sung this song, Father Abraham has many sons, many sons has Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. The reason you sing that song is because you're a son of Abraham or a daughter of Abraham because of your faith. That's why you can sing that song. It has nothing to do with your heritage. Now, this last verse in here, he gives life to the dead and calls into being things that do not exist. This reminds us it's not always easy to have faith in the midst of a circumstances or situation we may be in. What was Abraham's situation that required him to have faith? Hmm. In the natural realm, it was hard for him to believe that he was going to be called the father of many nations. This is why he had to have faith, okay? He was called, he said, God said, you're going to be the father of many nations. Do you believe that or not? Now, Abraham might be thinking, yeah, I'm not even a father of one kid, a father of many nations. He was so old when he first received this promise, and so was his wife. He was about 100, she was about 90, and he had complete faith in God that this promise would come true. Verse 18, in the hope against hope, he believed that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Like what? The sand, like the stars. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. You see, when Abraham heard God saying, you're going to be the father of many nations, doesn't he have, a, doesn't even have one descendant at this point? He could have looked at his 100-year-old body in his wife's barren womb, and he could have said, yeah, that ain't happening. There's no way that's going to happen, God. I think God put him in that circumstance because if he was 20 years old, right, and Sarah was 18, they just got married, you're going to have a lot of kids. I can believe that. How about when you're 100 and she's in her 90s and I tell you, you're going to have a lot of kids. Can you believe that? Well, he did. That's the amazing thing. He believed it. He never wavered. He chose to believe God. You know what? If you said it's going to happen, I think it's going to happen. And the moment that he did that, the moment he said, okay, God, yeah, yeah, I'm in. I believe you. The moment he said that, he was made righteous. Not when he did something. That's what you have to understand. This isn't about any works. It's when he believed something. He didn't even move a muscle. God said, I'm going to make you father of many nations. Okay, let's do this. And it's the same for us as well. It's not when we do something that we get right with God. It's when we believe something. And that's what the final verses of the chapter assure us of. It says, therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, listen. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our wrongdoings and was raised because of our justification. Look at this parallel. Abraham believed that God could bring life from his and Sarah's near dead bodies and produce many nations. And that faith pleased God. 
And that faith gave Abraham righteous standing in God's eyes. And what these verses are saying is, you and I have believed that God could bring life from the dead. The buried body of Jesus could live again. And that faith, when we say, I believe that, yeah, I believe Jesus was crucified, died, and risen again. The moment we do that, that faith pleases God, and it gives us right standing or righteousness in God's eyes. That's why we're the children of Abraham. We're doing what he did. We're taking God at his word and saying, you said that happened, then it did. That's all I need to know, God. It has nothing to do with how good we are. It only has to do with how good he is. And the belief that his goodness and his grace and his love are enough to overcome our weaknesses, our frailties, and our shortcomings. And so let's go back and reflect for ourselves on the beauty of what David wrote in Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. How blessed is he, that's you and me, how blessed are we whose wrongdoing is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is a person like us whose guilt the Lord does not take into account. That's something you can build your life around. That can be the cornerstone of your faith. And so we're going to close with a song here. I'm going to ask Phil to come up and join me. There's a song called Cornerstone. morning church always a pleasure to sing with this gentleman thank you Phil looking at my window feeling the crescendo sunset on a quiet sea sitting with the ones that I'll forever love we're waiting on a flash of green and even when the nights got cold, you have always held me close. You're the only rock that I could ever stand on. You're the only one for me. The sun goes up, the sun comes down. This old world keeps spinning round. I'm here traveling down this long and winding road. Seasons come and seasons go. They take me high, then leave me low. I'm still standing on the only rock I know. You're my cornerstone. Oh, oh, oh. No matter where I go, my cornerstone. Oh, oh, oh. Bible by my bedside, sweating out a long night, wrestling with the hounds of shame. Trying to turn their hands back on a troubling past. Every move I make's in vain. But even in the shifting winds, you are who you've always been. You're the only rock that I could ever stand on. Through it all, you remain. The sun goes up, the sun comes down. This old world keeps spinning round. I'm here traveling on this long and winding road. Seasons come and seasons go. They take me high, and leave me low. But I'm still standing on the only rock I know. You're my cornerstone. Oh, no matter where I go, my cornerstone. Oh, on Christ the solid rock I'm standing. Christ the solid rock. All of the ground is sinking sand. The solid rock I'm standing. Christ the solid love. All of the ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I'm standing. Christ the cornerstone. All of the ground is sinking sand. 
You're the only one that I will build my life on. Through it all, you remain. The sun goes up, the sun comes down. This old world keeps spinning round. I'm here traveling on this long and winding road. Seasons come and seasons go. They take me high, then leave me low. But I'm still standing on the only rock I know. You're my cornerstone. Oh, no matter where I go, my cornerstone. Oh, well, Father, we thank you today that the cornerstone of our lives is our faith in Christ. And that we could be confident through what Abraham did, that that's all we need is our faith. Yes, we will try to, to live righteous lives by your grace, because that's what you called us to. But we're not going to do that on our own. We can't. We've tried. We've failed. But our faith is that in Christ, we can be made righteous. In Christ, we are made righteous. That when you see us because of our faith, you don't see our sins. You don't see our failures. You see the righteousness of Christ that was given to us the moment we believed. And we thank you that you didn't make salvation hard. You made it easy. You didn't make it something we had to earn or work for or scrape for or beg for. You made it something we simply had to believe for. And we thank you in the name in which we have believed, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The altar. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the service and you want to learn more about the ministry, head over to the website at praisetabernacle.church where you can learn about all the ministries Praise has to offer. Find devotional content, weekly newsletters from the pastors, and much more. We hope to see you soon right here at Praise Tabernacle because we are people restored and inspired serving everywhere.